ladies and gentlemen, co colleagues, friends, welcome to the 50th birthday party of the Industrial Relations Society of Victoria. Um, my name is Greg Bamber. I have the honour to be the current president of the society and it's a, a great uh, privilege to welcome you here to this uh, celebration. Uh, before saying anything else, I wish to give appropriate acknowledgement to the original indigenous peoples who were the first owners of the land on which we are sitting. And we have some very special guests with us today, uh, including uh, former Prime Minister Bob Hawke, of course, and um, Barry Cassidy, a TV uh, presenter, and Heather Hewitt, also from the ABC uh, television. And we are filming this for posterity and uh, for the Ind Industrial Relations Society of Victoria website, and no doubt it will go viral. So uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to acknowledge the very first president of the Industrial Relations of Society of Victoria, who founded this society along with uh, a few other good people, uh, Professor Joe Isaac. I wonder if you might stand up, Joe. Mm. Mm. So, uh, Emeritus Professor Joe Isaac was, I think at the time he founded this society, just moving from Melbourne University to Monash University and was one of the earliest uh, professors at, at Monash and he's uh, still very active at uh, the university. Whenever I call round to see him, he's in his office and much more likely to be in his office than most of the full-time salaried younger academics. Um, and uh, Joe, we invited Joe to say a few words, but he, he asked me to uh, give his very best wishes to you all on his behalf. Um, he, he just reminded me that this society was notorious, as he put it, uh, in, in years gone by, when he said it was known as the Industrial Relations Club, and that's where, that's where things got fixed. And, and Joe says he's a very proud member of the Industrial Relations Club, and it's wonderful to see so many other members here. And those of you who are not members, uh, feel free all, it's not often people say this at a, at, a, at a lunch, but you're welcome to take the coffee mug with you. We encourage you to take the coffee mug and that also has uh, the website address on where you can download a membership form. If your membership has, has lapsed or if you're not currently a member, uh, please do um, download the membership form or there'll be a few spare membership forms uh, at the table, I'm sure. And, I just mentioned a couple of VIPs. As far as I'm concerned, you're all VIPs, all the uh, industrial relations community. And one of the wonderful things about this society, Joe, and the way you and your colleagues conceived it, is that it, it represents and brings together all the various stakeholders in the interesting and always fascinating field of industrial relations. It includes people from unions, from employers, from managers, um, third parties, mediators, conciliators, arbitrators, members of the legal profession, people from government, and even academics. And there are a few academics uh, colleagues in the room. Who, who have I left out? And, and, and other interested persons. I think you had a... You had a uh, and, and anyone who wishes to come into the field, Joe, when you wrote the rules, you, you were very uh, broad in, in, in the way you conceptualise the society. And that's one of its great benefits, that it gives people a chance to cross-fertilise uh, in, in different uh, ways across professional boundaries. And there's not many other organisations that give that opportunity. Uh, I, di I didn't mention consultants. It also welcomes uh, consultants uh, in, in, into, in, into our field. And, and we are... The Industrial Relations of Society of Victoria is affiliated to the National uh, Australian Labour and Employment Relations Association. We're very fortunate in having uh, Brian Lacey with us, who's the national president of uh, the ALERA, and you'll hear a word from Brian a little later. Uh, and ALERA, in turn, 
That's the Australian National Association is affiliated to ILERA, which is the International Labour and Employment Relations Association. And as many of you would recall that ILERA recently held its Asian Congress here in this fair city. And Brian and his team were the organisers of that uh, excellent uh, Congress. And, and it has other international congresses coming up. So one of the benefits of being in the society is it gives you access to events in other states, in our sister societies all across Australia, but also all around the world. So there is a, an international conference coming up in Bogota next year. Um, and the following year, there's going to be one in Cape Town. Uh, and, and, and so another benefit of being in the society is getting the newsletter and and, and, and hearing about opp opportunities to, to, to go and discuss industrial relations issues in, in other parts of the world. If anyone's interested in getting involved with any of our subcommittees or on the committee, we're always looking for volunteers to get involved in the society. We have a range of activities throughout the year. Some of them take place at lunchtime, some at breakfast time. Uh, some in the evenings as dinners. We have a wine tasting group, a women in industrial relations group. There's all kinds of uh, ways to participate in the society. And if the particular aspect that you're looking for uh, currently isn't on the agenda, then uh, feel free to uh, help to start a new activity. I, I've been asked to say there's a cash bar just outside if anyone wants to have an extra drink at all for the table or, or subsequently. Um, and I think that's about all I need to say at this point, other than enjoy the lunch. Uh, the main course will come out very soon. And then after the main course, we're going to have some discussion between uh, Barry Cassidy and Bob Hawke. And that'll also include an opportunity for you to uh, raise questions. So think of uh, questions not too technical. Bob doesn't want to get into any technical legal details of the of the 1988 Act or, or, or the Fair Work Act or whatever. So I think broad uh, g general insights uh, and, and, and Bob is in a tremendous uh, position to share some of his thinking with us. So in, enjoy. Thank you very much for coming along. Mm. Uh, I, w I want to first of all acknowledge uh, Professor Joe Isaac who, um, as you all know, was the founder of the Industrial Relations Society. I acknowledge also uh, our IRSV president, Professor Bamber, and our special guests, uh, Michael Mangos, Robert Ray, uh, Kate, uh, Richard, and her son, Barry. As you know, Kate Richard, Kate, uh, sorry, Kate uh, Barry is the uh, daughter of um, uh, Sir Richard Kirby, who was the uh, patron of the IRSV for quite a number of years and made a significant contribution to industrial relations generally. Um, we are very extreme, we're extremely fortunate to have here today um, uh, Bob Hawke, the Honourable Bob Hawke, uh, to have a conversation with uh, Barry Cassidy. Uh, given that we're celebrating 50 years of um, Industrial Relations Society, who better to have along to talk about Industrial Relations Society than someone who actually lived through that whole period? Um, Barry uh, Cassidy, of course, is a journalist, as you probably all know. And he kicked off his career at the age of 12 years, writing match reports on the uh, Chilton Football Club for his hometown weekly, the uh, Federal Standard. Today, Barry is one of Australia's most experienced political journalists. He's covered federal politics since the late 1970s, uh, spending a lot of time in uh, the Parliamentary Press Gallery in Canberra. In the late 1980s, Barry was Senior Press Secretary and Political Advisor to the Prime Minister, Bob Hawke. Once asked about his worst and, and best moments with uh, Bob, he identified a couple of very significant events as his best moment. But he went on to say his worst moment was his first day in the job. He had to fly to Perth with uh, the Prime Minister. During the flight, Bob didn't say a word. When they landed in Perth, Bob handed Barry what he thought was a crumpled pile of newspapers, which Barry promptly threw in the bin. When they got to the hotel, Bob demanded what was in fact his meticulously marked up copy of the form guide. <laughs> Barry nonetheless survived uh, in the job and went on to prove himself a very valuable press secretary and political advisor. 
He's worked as a political respondent for the ABC TV News and for the 7.30 Report and currently hosts the very popular Sunday morning political discussion programmers, it programs Insiders and Outsiders. I acknowledge also Barry's wife, Heather Hewitt, who is herself a, uh, a very well-known political journalist of some note, reporting on political issues re regularly on the 7.30 report. Um, back to Barry. Barry is a published author. His most recent publication, The Party Thieves, is an incisive analysis of the rise and fall of Kevin Rudd and Malcolm Turnbull and the consequent accession, accession of Julia Gillard and Tony Abbott. As I said at the outset, we're very, we're very fortunate to have both Bob Hawke and Barry Cassidy uh, for our discussion today, and I now give you Bob Hawke and Barry Cassidy. Well, thank you, Brian uh, and Greg. Um, it's, there are so many facets and so many momentous events in, in Bob Hawke's life, but what we'll be doing today will be walking back through his experiences in industrial relations and celebrating 50 years for the society in that way. Um, but of course, um, this event doubles as the Sir Richard Kirby lecture. And so with that in mind, I think we should start, uh, Bob, with a few thoughts from you on uh, the guy who was, I think, known as Dick until he was knighted and then became Sir Richard, uh, Sir Richard Kirby. A few thoughts on, on him and his place in history. A great man. Uh, <clears throat> We had a, an interesting, and, and before I go on, I'd like to welcome his daughter, uh, Kate, who's here. Welcome, Kate. Um, we had an interesting start. <clears throat> before I went to the ACTU, uh, I was doing my doctorate at the Australian National University on the, it was on the whole question of the uh, development of the concept of the basic wage within the arbitration system. And uh, I went and interviewed uh, Dick and I was, apparently pretty scathing about the judgments that are handed down recently, including the abolition of the courtly adjustments. And he apparently confided to, to a number of people, uh, this was an intelligent young man, but bloody rude. Uh, and uh, so it was interesting when my, my first case was 1959, the basic wage case, and, uh, and uh, Dick was presiding. Um, and uh, it was touchy for a while because I was basically uh, teaching them economics, about which the judges knew very little, uh, and uh, trying to persuade them that they'd been infinitely bloody stupid uh, and that there, were, there was a, a path to redemption. And uh, this was a, a rather delicate uh, sort of situation, but, and it's one within which a lesser man than Dick Kirby <coughs> would have taken offence and uh, been less than generous. But he was fantastic. He, he, he had an open mind. He genuinely listened to argument and was prepared to concede where he had been mistaken. And uh, in the event, uh, I'm not just saying this because I got good decisions from him, but the the quality of his mind was and and of his his decency as a human being was quite outstanding. I don't think the arbitration conciliation and arbitration commission could have had in those difficult times a better uh, a better equipped and a more decent human being to head it up. I I came to love the man. And his name will uh, come up again as we proceed uh, today. Um, but let's start with the beginning when you first uh, joined the industrial movement. Um, it, you were still at university when you were offered the, the job as research officer yeah. and advocate for the ACTU. And in a sense, that was probably the most important job that you were ever offered because it was a springboard to everything else. Um, yeah. But how did it come about uh, when, while you were still at uni? <coughs> well, <coughs> uh, there's, I think there was... <laughs> someone looking after me for a long time. I, uh, I did well at uh, modern school, Perth modern school. I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. So I decided I'd do a law degree, not with any intention of, of becoming a, a, a lawyer as such, but I thought it would provide a, a useful basis for other things. And um, in the event that was proved true, I, there's hardly been a day of my life since 
then since I finished my law degree, in which in one way, directly or indirectly, you know, knowledge of law hasn't been of some use. But um, then I did uh, uh, an economics uh, uh, degree, or finishing off because of some of the units you did as a lawyer were appropriate for that. And uh, I was in the rather unusual position that uh, you know, I got the Rhodes Scholarship at the end of 1952, uh, was awarded it in, in Perth, and I hadn't quite finished my economics degree, but they'd appointed me as a tutor in economics before I'd actually got my degree, which has been interesting. <laughs> and then I, I, I went off to Oxford and started doing PPE, it's philosophy, politics and economics, and after a term and a bit of that, I thought this is a waste of bloody time because I was essentially doing stuff that I'd done in the law and economics degree. And I thought I could use that time more effectively. So I went to Rhodes House and a college and said I'd like to do a research degree. Would that be all right? And I said, yep. So I went to Rhodes House and I was absolutely fortunate. They had a marvellous library there. And I wanted something that combined the law and economics and I thought about the development of the Arbitration Commission and the basic wage. And I, I couldn't have had a better equipped library if I'd been you know, back in Australia. They had the convention debates, they had all the Arbitration Commission reports, they had the newspapers of the period in the 1890s. So I had a little corner in, in Rhodes House which was called Digger's Corner and I had, that was mine. And uh, so um, I, got, I, I did my degree there got a scholarship to come to the ANU to go on with this uh, research into the arbitration of the basic wage. And I said to Jeff Sawyer, who was the Dean of Law uh, at the ANU, great bloke, a Melbourne based, uh, he'd been in the law school here in Melbourne. I said, do you think it'd be a good idea if I actually went down and, uh, to the Congress of the ACQ, ACDU and, because they were having a special Congress on the basic wage. He said, yes, so I went down there and they were very kind to me and they soon found out I knew more about the basic wage than anyone in Australia probably. And they looked after me and they asked me then if I would come down uh, while I was still doing my study and help Dick Eggleston, who was an outstanding um, barrister, you would remember Joe here, a leading barrister in Sydney and he was doing the cases for the ACD when I was sort of assisting him while I was still at the university. Then, um, one day in 1958, early 58, I was up in Sydney from Canberra at an ACDU function, and old Albert Monk, who was uh, president of the ACDU, uh, not a, a voluble old open, didn't mind a drink, and uh, he's sitting down next to me, and he put his arm around me and he said, uh, Robert said, will you come and work for us all time and be our, our advocate, do the cases, just like that. So it was as though this was the culmination, as you say, of just everything came together, all my study and been leading up to this point. And even though you're still at uni, so uh, that would have been a big decision to take. You took it. The industrial relations movement or the labour movement in Melbourne then was uh, split right down the middle <laughs> between the, 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 the John Curtin Hotel and the Dover, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's absolutely right. What side were you on? <laughs> <laughs> I was in John Curtin. I tell you an interesting uh, story there about the two... Um, the, the groupers used to be down in the Dover and the non-groupers, uh, we were in the John Curtin. And uh, there were some marvellous members of the Communist Party uh, who, uh, you know, I'm virulently anti-communist philosophically, but I respected very much some of the people who were communist officials. And none more than Jim Healy, who was the Federal Secretary of the uh, Waterside Workers, an outstanding man. And he was on the interstate executive of the ACDU and when they were down for that, I would have a drink with them in the bar of John Curtin afterwards. And um, Jim and I were there having a drink and then something very strange happened. Uh, in walked John Maynes. <laughs> He's the central secretary of the Clarks Union. <laughs> that far right, you couldn't see him. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, when he came in, there was hissing and booing, and he walked over to, uh, to Jim, and what he wanted to do, Jim had just organised a, an agreement on the wharf, and uh, it was a pretty good deal, and John wanted to talk to him about it in terms of the tally clerks who he covered. 
and uh, all these blokes would kick up the noise. And Jim, who was a, had a very significant authority about him, he told him to shut up because uh, this man was here on union business. And I just thought it was marvellous. Jim, despite the fact that there could have been a greater divide in terms of politics between himself and uh, Mainz, he recognised the genuineness of what Mainz was about and trying to get information which would be helpful to his members. And so they shut up and Mainz uh, finished his talk and went off. And I thought it was an enormous tribute to, uh, to Jim Healy. Now, you mentioned the 1959 wage case, and that was uh, sort of uh, your first really big test. Mm. Was, essentially, did it come down, the arguments then came down to the question of whether uh, wages ought to be linked to just productivity or whether prices ought to be taken into account as well? Yeah. Up until 1956, uh, from starting back to the, the, the I-20s, there'd been a system of quarterly automatic adjustment for changes in the CPI. Uh, so the concept was that the real value of the wage would be maintained and periodically they would meet and see if there should be some increase in the terms. Uh, but then in 1956 uh, they abandoned uh, the cost of living adjustments. An interesting story behind that, going back to my Oxford days, when I was saying I was going to do a a thesis and decided to, on the basic wage at the Arbitration Commission. I went to see Professor Colin Clark, uh, who was then an agriculturalist and Australian, who had been you know, out here in Australia and uh, gone back to England, and said that I, I, would he be my supervisor? And what's your subject? And I said, I told him it was basic wage, I developed the basic wage. He said, no. And he, he uttered these famous words. He said, Hawke, he said, I have no interest in that, but more importantly, I'm sure the University of Oxford has no interest. So I thought, bugger him. <laughs> and went and found another Australian professor there who was very interested. And it turns out that um, Clark was very, very, very close to Santa Maria and the, uh, the Catholic Social Rural Movement. And he had been uh, talking and negotiating with Santa Maria to try and get uh, a uh, the courtly adjustment knocked out because they thought that this was not in their interest. And Santa Maria, I found out subsequently from one of the judges on the court, Al Foster, who sat on my first case, he said Santa Maria was wearing the carpets thin outside the Chief Justice Kelly, who was also a Catholic, uh, uh, pushing this out. So this bloody Colin Clark, who said he had no interest, had been up to his bloody eyeballs <laughs> in trying to fix it. And he didn't want some smart-ass young research student coming and examining it all. So that was the, the, the uh, background there, but it was... Uh, uh, we had to argue that capacity to pay uh, was relevant, but you, you couldn't have capacity to pay in a relevant sense unless there was some mechanism, uh, if not automatically, at least within a judgment, to take account of a price rise. If you just did what the employer said, well, just for, if productivity is increased by 3% would increase by 3%, but if prices increased by 3%, you'd done nothing. So it was a complex argument of, of teaching the bench who really were, if not economically illiterate, they certainly weren't terribly well versed in economics. But uh, to their credit, as I said in regard to, to Dick, you know, they were open-minded, they listened. Well, you won that, but then... Um in the mid-60s then, that was all sort of reversed. Um, this time, Sir Richard was overruled. Um, and you played a pretty big card in that case in 1965. There was a thing called the Vernon Inquiry, right, in, in, into the economy. And, and you didn't think things were going so well, so you subpoenaed the entire committee, right? The Vernon. Uh, no, I did it. Uh, well, the case started off from Jimmy Robinson, uh, who was the counsel for the uh, employers. A lovely bloke. We were good mates and fight like tooth and nail on the court and they'd go down and have a couple of beers at the end of the day. Um, 
and uh, he was quoting the, the Vernon report, which had said that the, the, the wages share of, of uh, national income had kept up uh, and uh, that the adjustment should be, wages should just be adjusted for productivity. And uh, you could see uh, the bench uh, lapping this up, or the, the, the more conservative members of the bench lapping this up. And uh, so um, I said to uh, uh, my chaps that were with me, the trade union officials who were sort of a panel with me, I said, we're going to be effed if we uh, don't do something about this. And I said, the only thing to do is, you know, submission, uh, subpoena um, Vernon, uh, the chairman of the Vernon committee. So I went back to the AC office and Harold Souter, who was the secretary, was all in favour. Um, Albert Monk was uh, a bit more of a conservative of these matters and he was a bit worried by it. But to his credit, he said, OK, if you think it's necessary. So um, I subpoenaed uh, um, and uh, I had prepared some statistics which showed that their tables were in fact wrong and uh, I put this to him and uh, he agreed that they'd got it wrong. <laughs> uh, the faces at the other end of the table were a joy to behold. <laughs> Uh, but uh, then they uh, said, uh, 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 you know, well, Vernon's not a professional economist. Uh, wait until he calls uh, Carmel, uh, chief economist at Adelaide University. So I uh, called Carmel and uh, I uh, made sure that he'd read the transcript and I put him in the box. I said, Professor, have you had the opportunity of uh, reading the traps? Yes. And uh, did you see the answer that Sir James gave uh, the thing saying it was wrong? He said yes. He said, I agree, with, uh, I agree with Sir James. You were right. So that was it. And then, of course, um, when Albert Monk moved on as head of the ACTU, you would think that ordinarily uh, the secretary, Harold Souter, who you mentioned, uh, would step up and not the industrial advocate, but that's not the way you saw it. In fact, at the time, I think, well, no, since then you've described Harold Souter as being the first Bill Hayden in your life. Uh, by that I mean, I assume you mean that the first guy you had to crawl over uh, not, to, not crawl to realise over. your ambitions. Not crawl over. Okay. How would you describe it? <laughs> Jump. <laughs> Jump over. All right. Leapfrog. <laughs> so so you, you, you pulled off the leapfrog yeah. and, and you became um, president. Yeah, it was very... Uh, it was just a, Interesting. One funny story involved in it, uh, and I want to place on record my respect for Harold Souter. He was a very, very efficient secretary. Uh, in my judgment, uh, he wouldn't have made uh, as good a president as I would have made. That was my <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was my honest judgment. And um, and anyway, we we worked together subsequently well. But the the, the Congress was uh, in Melbourne, uh, the 1969 Congress and it was in the Paddington Town Hall. And uh, the Paddington RSL was directly opposite Town Hall and the Paddington RSL had made all the delegates honorary members of the RSL for the duration of the Congress, which meant that uh, many of the delegates spent a fair amount of their time in the RSL. And uh, the election was gonna be on the Thursday and so out my troops and Harold's troops were chasing delegates everywhere and so on this morning I went across and uh, to chase up some delegates and um, the Federal Secretary of the Ships, Painters and Dockers Union, uh, a great big Irishman, um, his name will come back to me in a minute, great big fella, Paddy, and uh, he was playing the pokies. And he'd been very successful. He had a pile. <laughs> he was piled up with a thing. Going, he's piled. So I was going up. And uh, so I went back to the town. I came back a couple of hours later. 
and his fortune had turned, and he was down to his last two or three, <laughs> two bobs. He put them in, and they went, and he's gone. The great big black and grabs, and he's a, a communist. Uh, he grabbed hold of this machine, he says, you filthy, rotten, capitalist contraption. <laughs> Uh, so there's always a bit of flexibility in industrial relations. <laughs> All right, well, that almost uh, coincided with... Well, Billy McMahon was um, fairly early on then. Um, when you were in that role, um, he became Prime Minister and the, the oil dispute broke out over the 35-hour week and, mm. and McMahon was threatening all sorts of things, including calling in the military and, uh, mm. and so on. And, and, and that's when you first came into contact with Ted Harris, yeah. uh, who was at Ampol at, at the time. Yeah. And, just sensible negotiation sort of the whole thing out, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. I just saw Ted the uh, first time for a few years um, uh, down at the uh, Sporting Australia Hall of Fame here in Sydney last week with John Bertrand. And uh, yeah, you remind me, he was very, very good. He was head of Ampol. And we sat down and uh, uh, he agreed to the sort of things I was saying. And he was, I mean, I was conceding, but he was conceding. But, and together we. Uh, talk some sense into McMahon, which wasn't the easiest thing in the world to do. <laughs> um, you, you built a bit of a reputation. Now, some people in the media uh, called you the fireman, um, with the sense that um, you would wait until the uh, dispute would took off and there was the big fire raging, and then you would step in and put it out. How did you feel about that sort of characterisation? Oh well, you know, you remember the media. You know what hopeless parts that some of them are. <laughs> What a great lack of understanding of realities they have. <laughs> Not you, of course, yourself. <laughs> no, um, you'd... Um, well, if, if a dispute had assumed national proportion, it, it was because there was some substance and reality in, 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 in the claim that was being made. Not necessarily the, the full amount of the claim, but there was some justification for movement. And so you'd support but you couldn't tolerate a situation of a dispute going on forever. You'd have to reach a point where there was some compromise and resolution. And um, uh, the, uh, that created some, some problems at the time. As I remember, there were two you know, communist blokes in the metal trades workers who were very contrasting in the way they went about it. There was Laurie Carmichael, uh, who came from Sydney, the metal workers, and there was Halfpenny here in Victoria. Um, and you couldn't have had two more contrasting people. With Carmichael would fight, fight to the end, you know, for a tough and going on. Uh, but then, uh, once the decision was taken, He'd accept it, and he'd go out and do the toughest meetings, whereas the other bloke was a different uh, kettle of fish altogether. Um, so um, it was just a question of, of, of being realistic and having to make a judgment as to how long you could go on without damaging uh, the interests of your own people and, 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 and the economy. Now, one of the most high-profile uh, uh, disputes around about that time involved Frank Sinatra. <laughs> um, now, we're starting to get to the point where half the people in this room were born, but uh, <laughs> some were not. Uh, give us the background of that one. Well, you would vary in it because your association, the Australian Journalists Association, <laughs> were very deeply involved. Frank had come out and uh, at some thing which he was appearing his hoons, not he himself, but his hoons had roughly treated a female journalist. Uh, and she'd been hurt, not, not, you know, not critically, but she had been hurt you know, quite markedly. And um, so um, your union, mm -hmm. not affiliated to the ACTU, I might say, <laughs> decided, however, that you know, having been uh, outside, not being part of it, uh, and at times having been somewhat critical of us, uh, thought our services would be useful. <laughs> so they came to me and said, look, uh, there's something you can do about this. We, we want an apology from this bloke. And I thought they had a reasonable case, so I said, OK. So I got in touch with them and uh, said, uh, 
you know, we wanted an apology, otherwise he might find it difficult getting out of the country. <laughs> and uh, so the meeting was arranged in Sydney, um, next door to Westfield Tower, where I'm at the hotel there, the Boulevard Hotel, which was then the leading hotel in Sydney. And uh, to assist me in the proceedings, that, in the discussion I was going to have, the Secretary of New South Wales Labor Council, John Duck, was along with me. But by the time it came uh, to have the meeting, John was pissed out of his mind. <laughs> <laughs> so he was left below and I went upstairs and uh, went in there. It was very remarkable when we went up to the, you know, the matron. And obviously, uh, Frank Sinatra wore a, a corset because there he was. He was this bloody great st stomach. He, that, he didn't see it in public, but there he was. And uh, anyway, I, I was talking with his lawyer, and Frank was over in the background. And the lawyer said, well, you can't stop Mrs. Sinatra leaving. I said, well, um, as far as I know, there's only been one recorded case in history of someone walking on water. Uh, I said, some people have doubt about the authenticity of that story. But let's assume it was true. It's, it's, it was the only recorded case. Um, now, if you don't walk out, um, there's only aeroplanes and ships. And my affiliated unions uh, are very supportive of me, and they will not uh, move a ship or a plane on which uh, Mr. Sinatra is proposing to travel. So um, I suggest you have a little bit of a think again about whether I can do this or not. And uh, so he was, he was an arrogant bastard and he, he tried to, you know, go on and I said, well, look, uh, that, that's it. Uh, so uh, then Frank came over and Frank was, oh, I found him nice, like he, he said, I was going to explain what was happening and I said, all is required is uh, an apology and, and that's it. So uh, Frank, uh, and I, said, so I said, look, all right, so it's all right. It's very simple, straightforward thing. And Frank said, of course, that's all right. He signed it and that was it. And uh, uh, when, he, when he came back a few years later, he sent me a special invitation to attend his, <laughs> to attend his concert. Well, <coughs> your relationship improved with the media over there. Not for long, but um, <laughs> uh, your relationship with the media improved just a bit for, for, yeah. for a month or two as a result of that. Uh, so thank you. Um, around about then, you started, uh, you became, you were president of the ALP as well as um, running the ACTU, and yeah. you were. Um, um, I, I recall you saying at, at the time when somebody criticised you for wearing two hats, you said, well, if you can't ride two horses at once, you should get out of the circus. That's right. But in fact, you were, um, you were riding three horses, weren't you? Because you went on to the Reserve Bank board around about then. Yeah, yeah. So how, how was that sort of conflict? Because you, you needed to put a, an economic analysis to the country, and yet you were sitting on the, on the Reserve Bank board at the same uh, time. Com conflict? I mean, there representatives of business on the, on the Reserve Bank mm -hmm. board, but uh, you were... Uh, you, know, you acted with integrity, you put your case as you saw it, and that was it. Yep. And then, of course, the key thing, once you um, um, became uh, Prime Minister, was um, well, even in the lead-up to that, I mean, when you look back over it now, you started talking about uh, the need for an accord and for, for um, an economic summit um, before yeah. you were elected, mm. and then you'd started to develop the thinking about the three R's. Mm. Um, uh, but just how central was that to what you were about? Absolutely central. Could not be more central, because... You've got to remember what an absolute bloody mess the Australian economy was in. The, as I keep reminding people, the, the best observation, or the most accurate observation had been made in 1980 by Lee Kuan Yew, the Prime Minister of Singapore. And Lee Kuan Yew, Lee Kuan Yew said in 1980, if Australia keeps on going the way it is, it will finish up the poor white trash of Asia. And he was right. We were going out backwards. Uh, our unemployment was got rising, inflation was rising, our industry was becoming increasingly non-competitive. So uh, I realised it had to change. And the only basis on which it could change is if you had 
to people understanding the realities. Because I've always had a, a view which I've expressed, you probably heard me back in those days, and it's always remained with me. Ignorance is the enemy of good policy. And I knew that if I could get the facts before the people of Australia and their representatives, then I could get a mandate to move. And so we, I'd, in the lead up to the election, I'd been talking about the summit. And during the actual election, I said, within a month of being elected, I'll call a summit. We called the summit and I instructed and uh, uh, federal government, state government, local government, big business, small business, trade unions, churches, welfare organisations. All their representatives there, all had representatives. I instructed Treasury that every delegate had to have a brief, full brief, of all the economic facts that I'd received when I came in. And uh, so they all received that before they arrived. And I basically said to them, um, I said, business has a legitimist interest in wanting to grow its businesses and enterprise. Unions, you have a legitimate interest in trying to improve the wages and conditions of employment of your people. I said, you, the representatives of social welfare area, you have a legitimate interest in seeing that as things move, your people get some share. You've all in a position where you're more likely to achieve those legitimate ambitions if you cooperate together than if you fight. Got a unanimous communique, as you recall. And it was on the basis of that unanimous communique that I was able to give effect to the three R's. The three R's were uh, reconciliation, recovery, reconstruction. They were the steps I saw. We had to have reconciliation. The summit did that. And that then provided the basis on which I was able to, with my colleagues, bring in all those economic measures which moved to recovery and then to reconstruction. And it wasn't the, the summit itself was important in terms of um, advancing the accord, uh, because I seem to recall um, the Treasurer at the time, Paul Keating, wasn't exactly sold with the whole idea of the accord from the beginning, but he seemed to leave that, that summit, along with a lot of other people, persuaded, finally, that the accord was going to be important, and I think Bill Kelty was important in that now, as well. Now, to be fair to Paul, he, he, he hadn't been involved with me in, the, in, in, in all that lead up, and he had some hesitation, but he, once he saw the uh, summit work, he embraced it and, and he worked particularly closely with Bill. Mm. So the relevance today, now looking back over the Accord, is there is there a relevance to the way that is. it operates now? And yeah, I, and I, I, I just couldn't urge strongly enough on Tony Abbott, um, with whom I have good personal relations, I think some of his politics are absolutely bloody crazy, but uh, I like him personally and I hope I'll be able to have a talk with him and I think it would make a hell of a lot of sense if Tony were to replicate the, the idea, um, get the, the unions, the business community, the welfare, the churches, get them together and give them the facts and talk the thing through and try and get some common basis uh, for for action to meet the undoubted challenges we're, we're facing. Um, and um, I hope he, he might think about that rather than pursue some confrontationist attitude with the trade unions, because I think it should always be remembered. Uh, and I know I can be accused of having a prejudiced position in regard to the trade unions, but if you look at the history of this country objectively, the truth is, uh, that everyone in this room, every Australian, is indebted to the trade union movement because the standard of, of wages, conditions of employment, historically have been set by the action of the trade union movement, either acting alone or in conjunction with the Labor government. Uh, no one would enjoy the conditions they do if it hadn't been for the trade union movement. Another great thing the trade union movement did uh, in, in, in the Accord period was um, they actually forewent um, increases in money wages so that industry could become more competitive with that foregoing of increases in money wages being compensated on their part by improvements in the social wage. 
in the areas of health and education and so on. And that was a great contribution. And before that, I mean, when I was president, one of the things that tends to be forgotten but should never be forgotten was resale price maintenance. I was advocate in the ACTU and research officer pleaded with the Conservative government to do something about resale price maintenance. This was the practice whereby manufacturers would not supply retailers with products unless they charged the fixed price that the manufacturer said. And so there was no opportunity for discounting. And uh, I pleaded with them they wouldn't do anything about it. So when I became president of the ACD, I said, we're, we're, we're going to do something about this. And so when we got in the Burke store, uh, we were able to take on Dunlops. We beat them, they gave in, and resale price maintenance collapsed. In other words, the trade union movement saved the Australian people as a result of that decision. Literally, over the years, they've saved the Australian people billions and billions and billions of dollars. Now, all I'm saying is that Tony and, 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 and the coalition government should not have the concept that the trade union is some antagonistic force They've made mistakes for Christ's sake, of course they've made mistakes. But historically, it has been an enormous force for good in this country and it makes all the sense in the world to work cooperatively with them. Greg, I think you're ready to take some questions, is that right? Well, we've got two roving microphones. One's held by a representative from the ACTU uh, and another is held by a representative from the employers, appropriately enough. <laughs> Um, just to underline our plurality of interests. And, and someone gave me a question, an anonymous question, and then if anyone else has questions uh, from the floor, uh, the anonymous question is that the uh, Commission in uh, the last decade and a half or so has been deprived of authority to intervene in disputes by conciliation or arbitration except when called upon by both parties to do so and the Commission's been allowed to arbitrate only when the economy could be facing significant damage or, or the welfare or the safety of the population is threatened and the question Bob is do you think the Commission should have greater discretionary powers to intervene by going back to having compulsory conciliation and if necessary compulsory arbitration mm -hmm when it thinks it's appropriate uh, to do so. Yeah, well this is sort of one of the technical areas that I don't really want to get terribly involved in, but um, um, my, my tendency is to uh, think that it would be rather more sensible for, the, for there to be more flexibility, but I don't want to say anything more than that. Okay, fair enough. Well, uh, questions to the floor. Um, M Marilyn, and would you just introduce yourself uh, and keep the questions very brief, please? Marilyn. Uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, Marilyn Pittard from Monash University Law Faculty. Um, the airline pilots dispute of the late 1980s was a very important uh, dispute, sure. uh, I think, for, for industrial relations in Australia, and, and the Labor government was also directly involved in that dispute. I'm just wondering whether you could share any reflections or mm. insights into that yeah. dispute. Yeah, it, was, uh, it really was a tragedy, um, a tragedy for the pilots. Um, I pleaded uh, with their leadership um, that they must abandon their claim. They were not members of the, of the organised trade union movement. They had their, their union, but they were affiliated with the ACTU. Uh, and the ACTU and the organised trade union movement had committed themselves to wage restraint and that wage restraint had now been operating for several years from 83 and had demonstrably, according to every economist here and overseas, been a very large part responsible for the improvement and the increased competitiveness of the Australian economy. Uh, and here were these bloody pilots saying they were going for an increase of uh, over 20%. 30%. No, no, 30%. Um, and, uh, it just was not acceptable because if we'd permitted that to go ahead and said, okay, you're right, because the traditional thing, you know, with the, pilot, uh, with the pilots has been they'd pick off one airline, let the other one fly, 
and then put all the pressure on the on them. So one would give in, and so they are, that was it. And I said, that's not on. And they didn't quite understand that. They said, oh, you can't do that. But I said, well, let me tell you, you are not going to succeed. If necessary, I'll smash you. It's not what I want to do, but I have to in the interest of national interest. So they didn't get the message. Um, <laughs> and it had been put rather clearly. Um, and uh, so we got the, uh, the Army and Navy and the Air Force, and you know the result. Um, and uh, the pilots at the time uh, were pretty unhappy. Um, it was just interesting uh, that just this last week uh, they came up to me and said, uh, uh, he said, I used to fly you around and I was, as a pilot. And I said, oh, I thought, here it goes. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I just want to tell you, you were bloody right. <laughs> and I was. The spirit went on for about, for about 30 weeks. But in the end, wasn't it settled? They pretty much got the money they were looking for, but in terms of productivity, you ended up halving the number of pilots and virtually doubling their workload. Uh, no, 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 that's not right. They didn't finish up getting uh, anything like what they'd asked for. But they did. But the numbers of pilots oh, no. over the next year or two oh, yeah, were yeah. half. Well, they, they, they were. You know, their workload was just you know, pathetic. Yeah. And the mistake they made, of course, was um, was to resign. Yeah. Yes. Anyway. They, they had very bad leadership. Uh, Trevor Clark from the ACTU, you've got a question up on the It's uh, left Anthony there. Clendinen, uh, just an industrial relations consultant. Um, so uh, we noticed over the last 10 years, uh, or decade or so, that uh, union membership's been declining um, quite significantly. So, you know, as, as a strong advocate for the, for the union movement, what do you think unions uh, should be doing to, you know, in, improve their, uh, I guess, value to, to members and, yeah. and that sort of thing? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's a worldwide phenomenon, as you know, not just in Australia. Um, and it's a result of uh, changes in technology and workforce participation. Uh, you don't now have the, the large aggregations of workers in one place and factories and so on, the way you did before, so the ease of organisation. So there's the change in, in, in technology, and, uh, including, the, you know, in many cases, people being able to work from home rather than going to some workplace. And, of course, the participation, more women in the workforce, and it is more difficult for, uh, for, for women, uh, uh, generally speaking, it's been found to participate in, uh, uh, in unionism. Uh, although it's been marvellously enormous increase that has in fact taken place in the number of women who are um, in positions of leadership in the trade union movement. So there are these basic economic uh, and demographic factors that are operating. And so, it, so it's not just a question of, of, of unattractiveness of unions, although that may be a factor in, in some areas. As to the second part of it, what can they, they, the unions do, I think uh, the trade union, the ACTU over quite a long period now has been concentrating on on education, union education, and that makes sense to um, uh, educate uh, people about the trade union movement and to educate trade union officials in terms of their capacity to communicate. That's the basic way in which the trade union movement has to go in the light of these fundamental changes in the way goods and services are produced. Bernadine Van Gramberg. Mm -hmm. Thank you, from Swinburne. Um, you mentioned earlier that you would be interested in speaking with Tony Abbott about a, a form of the accord. And uh, just given the last question as well, how might that accord look? Just, just that union membership is quite low. How might that tripartite um, group look and, and what would be different from 19, post-1983? I'm sorry I didn't catch the last part. What, what, what? How, how would a new accord How look? would a new accord yeah, differ, look. From, differ? From yeah. how it was in 1983, um, if you were well, advising I'm, uh, Tony mm, Abbott mm, on how yeah, to Well, I, I'm not saying necessary that uh, such a meeting would lead to an accord as such. I'm saying let's take the first step 
bring the parties together um, inform them. I go back to my point about ignorance is the enemy of good policy. Let everyone know what the economic facts are now, what are the economic facts, exogenous economic facts, which are impinging upon us now and into the future, and what in those circumstances are the most appropriate policies if we want to optimise the operation of the Australian economy. Now, that's all I'm saying at this stage. Now, whether out of that there would come a natural impetus for an accord or something like it is a matter for that meeting. I think this will have to be the last question, Trevor. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Zana, by the way, from JobWatch. Um, with the Speak up. Sorry, Zana, by the way, from JobWatch. Um, with the coalition now in government, um, what are your insights about the prospects of the return to work choices or an industrial relations system akin to work choices? Well, they, um, they were badly scorched by work choices and uh, so they made sure that uh, at the last two elections they have uh, committed to not going back to it. Um, and the language they're using now is um, um, that they want to bring the pendulum back. That's the sort of language that's being used. They say it's, it, it had been uh, perhaps in the Howard's time too far to the employers. Under Labor it's gone too far. The unions, they want to bring it back. Oh, that sounds nice in a da 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 da. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, it goes back to what I'm saying before. All I'm saying is I want Tony Abbott and his colleagues to look at the trade unions the way I was talking about. A movement which, yes, has had mistakes. Yes, has created some problems, but overwhelmingly, historically, a force for good. If they get that mindset, then things will work out. Thank you. Um, Katie from KNL. Gates. Uh, Katie has done much of the work behind the scenes in getting this event happening along with uh, Nikki, uh, our Vice President function. So uh, just before mentioning that coffee's served in the foyer, so there's a chance for people to continue to interact over coffee and I'm assured there's a bar open somewhere in the building. For those of you who don't have to rush back uh, to work, but I'm going to hand over to you to have the last word, Katie. Thank you. Mm. Um, so I, I was a bit shocked when I saw it was five to two. I think we could all sort of sit here and, and listen to um, the Honourable Bob Hawke's words of wisdom and, and great experience for many years as, a, as someone who works in industrial relations and passionate in this area. It's, it's an incredible privilege and an honour to have you here at our 50th anniversary. Um, and we've just got a small token of, of our thanks, which we hope that you'll enjoy drinking out of your IRSV 50th anniversary mugs. <laughs> Um, so, thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank, you. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. And I just, just want to say again what a, a great pleasure it is to see my old mate uh, Joe Isaacs there. Uh, uh, you've been a great figure in the uh, history of industrial relations, both in a practical and an academic way. Uh, we'll never be able to uh, repay the debt that, that we owe to you. It's just a pity that our, old, our mutual old mate, George Pilates, isn't here. Uh, he was the chief employer's representative back in my days uh, as advocate and, uh, and uh, president. And uh, he was a marvellous opponent and a great friend. And I'm very sorry I wasn't able to, hear, to, to be here today. for attending. Um, thank you to Barry Cassidy for giving up his time to, to have a chat with Bob. Um, and um, for any of you... For any of you who are not members of the society, we, we encourage and implore you to, to join up. Um, it's a very important society which continues to be incredibly relevant today. Um, and we've got a lot of exciting events um, and initiatives coming up. So we look forward to seeing you at another event soon. Please enjoy a cuppa and um, we hope to see you very soon.
thanks everyone for coming along and Katie and look forward to seeing you soon. Cheers. Thank you.